how did you get involved in exposing institutionalized abuse? Um, for me, it started uh, when Dana asked me to take a look at Logan River Academy. She was um, already very dubious of the place uh, as a result of things that uh, her little brother, who was uh, institutionalized there, uh, he had told her. Um, and then upon a cursory review on the internet, um, it was kind of like um, training of like some good examples would be like the the recent Bill Cosby thing or the Roman Catholic Church pedophilia scandal or anything. When you see that many victims across that wide a time frame, who would not have uh, run into each other, would not have known each other, all telling very very consistent stories, um, you know that you're probably looking at uh, at the truth um, or you know. Statistically speaking, the odds of it not being true are, are so remote, right? And, um, you know, from there, I, I did all the normal things that you would expect, you know, someone to do. I called the police. I called the creditors. I called the licensors. I called the press. I called, you know, everyone I could think of to call to find out that, you know, people had been already at this battle for a long, long time and that all the calls that I was making had, in fact, already been made and ignored, Um so that was kind of disheartening. Um, I think like a lot of people, I was surprised that this kind of stuff still goes on in the 21st century in America. It's the type of stuff you'd expect, you know, in the 1800s, kind of pre Nellie Bly. And to find out that's still happening today to children was just shocking. What campaign or campaigns have you participated in or started? Shut down Logan River, uh, hashtag Free Justina. Um, hashtag justice for Chino, hashtag bring Natty home. Um, I know I'm probably forgetting a whole bunch here. Um, um, I think Keel is familiar with uh, the case of another child at Logan River named Fletcher. Um, I think that's the one that kind of plays on, I shouldn't say plays, but that, that pulls on my heart the most. I, you know, I don't feel we were able to really uh, achieve much for Fletcher. And I was hoping that. Uh, the Rolling Stone story would kind of do more towards that end, um, but for reasons outside of our control, um, you know, Rolling Stone wasn't able to, um, you know, fact check all the stuff affecting Fletcher that we would have liked. Uh, I follow just I follow Fletcher on social media, and he looks to be doing all right these days. Uh, he looks happy. Is that yeah. worth anything? Um, yeah, it is, but it's not. You know what I mean? Like closure is important. Yeah. Having some semblance of justice is important, and I feel like the Fletcher, especially, but a lot of the other kids at Logan River, have never gotten the closure that they deserve. Yeah. When did you learn of Justina Pelletier's case? Uh, I first heard about it late in 2013. Um, at that point, though, the, a lot of the information that would later come out was not out yet. So, for instance, uh, the open letter from uh, former Boston Children's Hospital psychiatric nurse Katie Higgins, where she described Justina's treatment compared it to torture, or said it'd be more proper, it'd be, it'd be more appropriate to call it by its proper term, torture, uh, had not been published yet. Uh, Barry Pollock, former federal prosecutor, board member of the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, uh, who described the psych ward where Justina was being held as, quote, virtually synonymous with abuse from any children, or appears virtually synonymous with abuse from any children, close quote, that had not been published. Um, and then the stories from the Hilliard family, the Melee family, uh, Nicole T, Elizabeth Ray, um, had not been published yet. I was not aware of the Sindri Highland story. I had not seen that yet. So kind of the stories of the survivors were not around at the end of 2014 and were not circulating in easy to find fashion. So I kind of put uh, the dog ear on it, you know, intending to follow back up with it uh, later. And the other thing was, you know, just from a, a practical angle, right, there were thousands of people talking about just seeing this story. And, and most of the kids that, um, you know, we try to help, they don't have anywhere near that kind of uh, um, support base, right? So I felt it was more important to, at the time to continue advocating for kids who, um, who didn't have thousands of people um, reaching for them, helping for them. Um, and then um, in between first hearing about Justina's story and really diving in, um, the Keeping Students Safe Act came up again, and uh, people reached out to us to help uh, support that on Twitter. Um, and so in between Dana's brother uh, coming home and me really diving into Free Justina, 
Um, there was the Keeping Students Safe Act, or the build up to trying to get that out of committee. Uh, and then after that, you know, after that was introduced, sadly it ultimately failed, um, you know, to get passed. But uh, I saw Justina's story surface again in March um, with the judge kind of dragging his feet. Or, and that was when I decided, and that's when all the other information, you know, these open letters and these other stories and all that was out there, and it was really possible to properly vet the story. Um, so at that point, I felt more comfortable becoming more involved. Okay, the next question, question is how did you get involved? But I think you kind of answered that. Yeah, I mean, how did I get involved? Mostly on Twitter, um, reading and, and, and vetting. Um, coming to that conclusion and then there's there's other stuff obviously I can't talk about for um for legal reasons. Um yeah, I will say that defending a child from grievous bodily harm, death and torture is, is not a crime. Uh it's not immoral and it's not in fact illegal. Okay. Why were you arrested? Um I was arrested predominantly for political reasons because the federal prosecutors and the Boston U.S. Attorney's Office, who are notorious after the Aaron Swartz case and numerous others, uh, chose not to investigate, prosecute, and punish their political allies at Boston Children's Hospital who have been torturing children for decades, uh, but rather to go after the person who, in accordance with common law, legal tradition, and morality, uh, was protecting a child from torture, grievous bodily harm, and death. And uh, under the UN Convention Against Torture, of course, the U.S. federal government is obligated to investigate, prosecute, punish, criminalize all acts of torture and other inhuman degrading or uh, human, inhuman degrading um, uh, treatment or punishment. And uh, you know they flout that treaty. Uh, Carmen Ortiz does not care about that treaty. Uh, that treaty is only important to the Boston office when they can use it for positive headlines for themselves, when it is their allies that are torturing children. Uh, they just ignore it. When will you know the outcome of your case? What is the status? Do you plan to appeal? Uh, we're currently set for uh, trial on uh, January 2018. Um, we don't know. I mean, obviously, there's a lot that can happen between then and now. Um, it's too early to be thinking about an appeal. Um, right now, we're, you know, we haven't even filed defense motions yet. Um, there's also kind of a, a growing uh, uh, social awareness of the case and what happened to, to Justina, and uh, there's going to be a change of uh, uh, leadership at that office uh, at some point soon. So we'll see what happens, you know, as a result of that. And after that, and you've got people on both sides of the political aisle clamoring to get uh, the current uh, heads of the Boston U.S. Attorney's Office out. Uh, it's taken way too long. Obama should have fired them when the White House petition uh, was going up after Schwartz's death. Uh, he didn't want to, you know, for whatever reason. Um, you know, the Obama administration, I think, disappointed people all across the political aisle in terms of uh, its, its lack of uh, enforcement of the Convention Against Torture. Um, uh, you know, and, and obviously, the, you know, what happened to Aaron Schwartz. Uh, was just horrific and, and should have uh, resulted in more people losing their jobs. Uh, so the bottom line is, uh, Democrats uh, have been clamoring to get Ortiz out of office, whether it's you know the Huffington Post, whether it's uh, Demand Progress co-founder uh, Mr. Siegel, um, you know whether it's uh, you know me and other activists like me, Senator Warren, um, right, have been clamoring for a change at this office for a long time. Um, similarly, on the left, right, you've got uh, California uh, House Representative Daryl Issa, uh, who called up the office before the House Judiciary Committee and slammed it for what happened to Aaron. Uh, you've got Republican Senator uh, Cornyn from Texas, similarly called up this office before the Senate Judiciary Committee and slammed it for what happened. Um, you know, you've got conservative voices in Boston like Howie Carr, who is straight up calling uh, calling acting U.S. Attorney Weinreb, who was hand-selected by Carmen Ortiz, the moniker Swamp Thing, right? So pretty much this office has no political allies as a result of its abhorrent behavior over the past eight years. What can our audience and members do to support you and call for your freedom? Um, that's a great question. Um, you can... Uh, 
write your congressman, write your senators, um, write the judge, uh, Judge Gordon, let him know, you know, what you think of what this office is trying to do and the immorality of their behavior. Um, you can apply pressure on Boston Children's Hospital, protest it, picket it, boycott it, um, you know, make it known online what they've been doing. I think the the best way to deal with torture is, is awareness raising and to call it out, right, and, and to make sure that it's not done quietly. What the U.S. Attorney's Office is trying to do in this case is basically silence the torture victim, prevent the acts of torture from being heard publicly, right, and basically suppress knowledge of what happened, right, and they must not succeed. Um, you know, that would be true if we're any case of torture, but when it's a case of torture against a, a learning disabled, physically sick child, it's especially heinous, and the fact that she nearly died, she's in a wheelchair, you know, it's just, it's so awful what happened to her. And they can only kind of do what they're doing um, in a world where people don't know what happened. And so they're hell-bent on, on keeping information, preventing uh, information about, you know, the true horror that Justine and her family endured um, from making it to the press. And I think that's the, the most important thing, not just for me, but for Justina and for the other kids, for the other activists, right? Uh, when the government tries to cover over uh, torture, it's important to scream, uh, you know, from the top of your lungs for everyone to hear. Is there anything else you would like to add? Um, I want to thank Heal uh, for supporting me through this uh, through this whole endeavor, um, for supporting Shet Logan River, uh, being one of the first um, first people to jump on the the bandwagon. Um, you know, the people at Heal are really phenomenal. Um, a lot of them are survivors themselves, so you know, it's it's not just a uh, it's not just a gig for them. It's not just a you know a volunteer opportunity for them. It's very very personal for them. Um, so I think that's very important to you know uh, to remember. Um, and uh, you know that you know torture does not have a political party. Um, it does not have a caucus. Um, you know it, it crosses political lines. And so the opposition to torture, you know, must similarly cross political lines. It must be a bipartisan issue. We must reach across the aisle. Um, it is a human issue. It unites us all in our common humanity and in our need to oppose it. Um, so I think that's very important to bear in mind as well. Okay. Thank you. No Thank you, Angela.